Now, from the most trusted names in local news, KDPG Sunday Edition. Good morning and welcome to the KDPG Sunday Edition. I'm Ken Rice. It was a notorious crime spree that included rape, a prison break, the killing of a Verona police officer and a Western Penitentiary prison guard, and the kidnapping and killing of a Cumberland, Maryland woman and her two-year-old daughter. Pittsburgh TV newscasts were filled with reports about a man who rivaled recent convicted killer Richard Poplowski for generating public outrage. From 1969 to 78, Stanley Haas was a wanted man by the FBI. His gruesome story is detailed in a new book called Born to Lose, Stanley B. Haas and the Crime Spree that Gripped a Nation. It's written by Butler native James Hollock, a former counselor at Western Penitentiary. This morning on the KDPG Sunday edition, we'll take a look at this famous case with three people who lived part of it themselves. Joseph Hoffman, now the chief of police in White Oak, but during the Stanley Haas crime spree, Hoffman, like Mr. Hollock, was a counselor at Western Penitentiary. Also with us this morning, Pittsburgh attorney Edgar Snyder. He served as a public defender way back when for Stanley Haas after his capture. David Shribman is away this week. Jim O'Toole, politics editor from the Post-Gazette, joins us for this morning's discussion. Thanks very much. This is, we, we think that the Richard Poplowski case dominated the local news for a while. Take us back to 1969 in the, in the period where uh, Haas was on the run during the 70s. What was it like? What kind of command did this story have over public attention? I think I'm going to hand this right over to Edgar Snyder. Uh, uh, I think that the uh, Poblowski case uh, paled in comparison to the uh, what went on at that particular period of time. This was uh, something that had uh, gripped Pittsburgh uh, during the entire time that he uh, had uh, not only escaped from jail, that had killed the police officer, that he was on his exploits. Uh, I remember very well uh, that uh, there were two top stories in 1969. Stanley Haas and nobody's boy Pete Flaherty, who sure. became the mayor <laughs> right. of the city. And those were, I remember, they were voted the two top stories. And it w he was in the headlines all the time. Well, I guess one, one difference is that there was a, a threat to the public. For, yes. for a long, for a good long while here, right. I mean, there was panic. I, well, indeed, I have uh, on, on some of the book signings. It is so interesting because uh, almost everybody will come up <clears throat> and speak to me and say and give me their Haas story. It seemed everybody had a Stanley Haas story. Even young kids, they they would say, you know, I I was only ten years old, but I remember my dad taking the shotgun out of the closet, and you know, we all slept together with a shotgun. These kind of stories, and my, so it made an impact on children. My, my law partner told me yesterday, uh, he was at the, we did a book signing out in Verona, and he told me, he said, I was nine years old at the time living in New Kensington. He said, and I remember them locking the doors and telling us we couldn't play outside because there's a good chance that Haas was going to come back to that area. So this was... <laughs> this was something yeah. that everybody was tuned into. And this, and this widespread fear followed uh, the murder of a Verona police officer, correct? Yes, indeed. Joseph Zanella. But, young, but, but let, me, let, me just, okay, let me just sure. back, let me just back up. Mm -hmm. How did it start? How did Stanley Haas first get into trouble? Okay, it, he had been sort of a local thug, primarily involved with auto theft burglaries, robberies as well. He, he was actually a, a pretty good criminal, good in the sense that he rarely got caught. And when he did, he just did a little bit of time. But what began this um, crime wave that we remember, and, and it starts off in the book with a couple of crimes that the public really doesn't remember, uh, but it started this odyssey. And that was the kidnap like abduction from a neighborhood street of a 17-year-old uh, Shaler Township girl, high school girl. She was uh, whisked off the street, uh, put in a car by Haas and another uh, criminal colleague, and the girl was raped. She was let off, you know, alive, um, but quite quite damaged over this. And there was. Uh, a, a sort of a search for him because he was driving a Corvette, Stanley Haas. He was caught, and long story short on this, uh, he was you know, apprehended, taken to trial, convicted of rape, placed in the county jail, which was so overcrowded they transferred 300 people to the old Blonox or a workhouse in Blonox. Um, 
among those 300 was Stanley Haas. He was gleeful over this because he was he was looking at now 10 to 20, and he'd hardly done anything over six months before uh, in time for his crimes. Uh, and he wasn't going to do 10 years, so he planned on escape, and he thought he could pull it off from the old decrepit sort of. Uh, he considered it soft the workhouse and indeed he did escape he made a daring rooftop escape with another criminal named the, uh, Tom Lubreski the oldest cliche in the movies right tying the bed sheets yeah together and going over the <laughs> yes over he the wall. did yes he did he, he cut through these old uh, soft Civil War era steel bars uh, with a hacksaw I hope he didn't get it from a birthday cake you know yeah um, and he had another big strong <coughs> partner in Tom Lubreski and they bent these bars and they winnowed through and got on the roof and threw those bed sheets down and, and you know it was a quite a daring adventure for okay. them and they did escape now at what point does uh, does young edgar snyder the or younger edgar snyder much uh, younger yeah. Yeah. <laughs> much younger at, 40, at, 40, <laughs> 41 years younger yeah <laughs> at what point do you begin representing stanley haas when stanley haas was uh caught in waterloo iowa uh he had to have a lawyer. This was right after the law had changed and said that uh, all indigent people had a right to uh, counsel in a, in a criminal case. I was a public defender at that time. Uh, there were three or four of us that were public. Today there's 70, but at, the, at that time it was new, and I was uh, an assistant public defender. And when he was caught, uh, I remember George Ross. Uh, who was deceased, but George was the public defender, came up to me and said to me, uh, you know, I got some good news for you and I've got some bad news for you. And the good news is uh, you're going to get tested because you wanted to be a public defender to become a lawyer and try cases. And the bad news is you're going to represent Stanley Haas. And that was when he was captured. They knew that they were going to bring him back to Pittsburgh to face the trial for, uh, for the police officers in Ella. And that's when I learned that I would have the... Um, they called it opportunity, yeah. and it was. <laughs> in the Poplowski trial, we heard a lot about, particularly in the penalty phase, his dysfunctional upbringing and all the things that had mm -hmm. led him to be so antisocial. But you make the point that Stanley Haas didn't have, doesn't appear to have had that kind of upbringing, <clears throat> that straightened circumstances, poor, but uh, a yeah. decent family. What do you account for the um, real evil that this guy was capable that's of? That's a great observation uh, that you just made. You know, we, we, we like to think everyone is, you know, that winds up doing these, these uh, horrible acts are very dysfunctional. I mean, and there's a reason for it, but sometimes we just can't really find the reason. Haas wasn't too bad off, really. Again, yeah, uh, sort of straightened circumstances a bit, but I, I mentioned in the book, but how many weren't sort of poor like that along all our river communities in the mm -hmm. 50s, you know? Um, I talked a great deal with uh, family members, uh, his wife, uh, mistress, uh, and the children, and uh, friends even. And there was one guy, uh, his name is Billy, Billy Coe, uh, he was with the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Pittsburgh for many, many years, and he said, he said you know, I grew up right beside Stanley Haas's family. Mm -hmm. And we all played together. He played primarily with Stanley and his brother Harry. Uh, and he said, if anything, our house was a little worse off than theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, and he liked the parents. This Mr. Coe, he said um, the parents were great, particularly the mother who made us, you know, jelly sandwiches. And um, it was normal. And others mentioned the the the, the mistress members remembers going over to the house and it was always come on in let's make some coffee and and they they hugged each other and played board games it's pretty normal so there was nothing that i could pinpoint except just an aberration of a, a psychopathic personality coming upon him from a young age and that's what happened you make the point that some of of the family members suspected an incestuous relationship with his sister Betty. What what's your conclusion on that? And would that have had anything to do with? I don't think it had anything to do with state? Uh, a murderous spree that he that mm -hmm. he went on. I think that did occur, but that comes from people in the know. Uh, uh, that. Uh, 
observed this over the years, and both mo both women in his life, his his mistress, whom he had two children by, and his wife with four children, both stated, "Yes, this is certainly what we suspect." And I think uh, a picture was shown to me of a daughter of a big family grouping. Um, this child here, we suspect, is a child of this incestuous relationship. Um, it's slightly retarded. The little girl was slightly retarded, mm -hmm. and it was the family conclusion that that was the offspring. Chief, Chief Hoffman, you were at, you were working at Western Penitentiary while Stanley Haas was uh, incarcerated there, correct? Right. I was uh, corrections counselor at Western Penitentiary from 1971 to 1973. Haas was already there. Um, and now, now, by this time, this is a guy who had been uh, in custody and escaped, killed a police officer, kidnapped and killed a young mother and her daughter. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy is That's correct. unique in that prison, right? Right. He was, I mean, there were a lot of very dangerous people in that prison at the time. There were about 1,000 inmates at the time, and about 110 were, were there for murder charges. So there were, there were, it was a high percentage of the population. Uh, were convicted uh, murderers. But nobody was better than Stanley Haas, well, right? with Haas, several situations happened. Um, one was <clears throat> where Herb Thomas, who was the psychiatrist, prison psychiatrist, asked me to assist him in having a group sessions with uh, inmates that had at least uh, two life uh, charges against them. Haas was one of them. And the, we, we did the sessions in the home block area in a cell area where later on the uh, corrections officer was when the assault and murder of Captain Peterson occurred. Uh, we would go there and for about an hour session we would do this for, for we did this for a long period of time and uh, in this one particular time Haas st uh, stated to me that I'm a born killer I don't know why. I remember that very, very, very succinctly because, you know, of how he said it. And he did kind of control that, that group of, of the murderers. And then the, the other situation that occurred was uh, when he attacked uh, Gino Sproul. And it was a situation that had occurred. A fellow inmate. A fellow inmate. Uh, there, there was a conflict the night before. Uh, Sproul made a statement. If, if you're so bad, get your get your your gear. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're talking about the fight the next day. And uh, Haas had two uh, <clears throat> shanks in his hand. And it was taped. And uh, Frank Phelan, one, one of one of the guys that he he, he was with in the prison, who was a convicted uh, contract killer from Philadelphia went back to back with him and they stabbed Sproul and stabbed him in the hand and then Sproul ran, came through the gate and we brought him into the gate and Haas would not say who, who uh, I mean Sproul would not say who, mm -hmm. who, who stabbed him at that point but every, everyone really yeah. knew then Haas was taken down to the home block. All right, let's, uh, let's take a break here. We'll continue our discussion in just a moment, including uh, the circumstances of Stanley Haas's death. Still, to this day, not everyone is convinced that the official story of how it happened is correct. More on the KDPG Sunday edition in just a moment. Welcome back to the KDPG Sunday edition. We're talking about uh, a new book that deals with an old crime, a notorious case in Pittsburgh, criminal history born to lose Stanley B. Haas and the crime spree that gripped a nation starting in 1969 and uh, a saga continuing until the mid-1980s with the death of Stanley Haas in prison. The book is written by Butler native, native James Hollock. He's with us here today. He's a former counselor at Western Penitentiary on Pittsburgh's north side. Also here, Joseph Hoffman. He's now the chief of police in White Oak, himself a former counselor at Western Penitentiary and a familiar face to all of us. Pittsburgh attorney Edgar Snyder, way back when, a public defense Defender who represented Stanley Haas and uh, actually won a case before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, saving Haas from the death penalty. We want to take a minute to look at the, some of the victims of Stanley B. Haas, starting with Officer Zanella, Joe Zanella, police officer with the Verona Police Department. Tell us a little bit about him. Well, Joe was a guy like, like many policemen, and Joe was one more that from his teenage years he always wanted to be a policeman. And 
It, it just turned out that a spot did become available after Joe did a, a stint in the Army. Um, and right in his hometown, native son, very popular, and uh, just well-liked, uh, committed to his profession. He was also a volunteer uh, fireman and in the reserves, so he's a busy guy, married a lovely uh, local woman, had uh, two children. In fact, uh, just two weeks, a week prior to his gunning down by Stanley Haas, um, his daughter Michelle was baptized, and all his, you know, colleagues and friends went to the baptism. Um, and, and, he's, they, and he spotted Stanley Haas. Yes, uh, pulled him over, or followed him into a parking lot. Well, indeed, uh, he was told the, by this radio is after Haas's escape from the workhouse. Yes, and Haas had escaped um, on September 11, 69, from the workhouse, and on September 19th. Haas had been in uh, Cleveland, but he stole the car there, came back, and he's driving along a High River Boulevard, stopped at a, at a Winkies on Washington Road there. Um, he was spotted by an old friend who called the police, so the alert went out to be on the lookout for, and they described the car. Well, Haas drove right into um, Verona, past the, the old police station, and Joe Zanella spotted that car and thought, I think I just got word on this and pulled out behind. And there was a small chase came about because of that. And um, they sped over the viaduct just into Oakmont. And then the first road into Oakmont <clears throat> was Plum Street. Haas quickly stopped his car. Joe Zanella pulled up behind. He had called for backup and he wondered how long, you know, to wait for it. He was afraid that Haas might bolt again uh, so he went for the arrest and here he didn't know I mean he was cautious but he didn't know if Stanley Haas was armed or not but he was and Haas pulled out a, uh, a 22 uh, automatic and fired two shots and one whizzed past Joe's head and the other one crashed into his chest and it it pierced his heart and he lived according to Dr. Cyril Wecht probably one or two minutes at the most. Mm. So, and uh, and you also make the point that there was poor communication among the police that delayed the backup. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't poor communication. It was the the radio systems were so convoluted that one local police department could not uh, communicate directly with the one right next mm -hmm. door to them, the, the very next police department. So. But there was one officer who didn't relay the word as soon as he had it. That's right. He sort of sat on it because uh, an arbitration meeting was going on with the Oakland Police Force. So uh, it was transferred from Penn Hills. Joe Zanella had to call Penn Hills. He couldn't call his own department or even Oakmont right, right next to him. So he called Penn Hills. They transferred it um, to Oakmont. And this one uh, guy did sit on this information for... Um, you know, a couple minutes when he should have been right on it. And this yeah. led to a huge manhunt. It was huge. Probably the biggest manhunt in Pennsylvania history, and it, and it might be to this day. It, it went from local to um, regional, then to tri-state. Then, with the kidnapping of this lovely woman and her lovely daughter in, in uh, Cumberland, Maryland, in that area, a little town called Laval, um, it turned, then the FBI became involved, and it was uh, directed by J. Edgar Hoover, a nationwide manhunt, where I think one of the few times in our history, uh, he elicited the, the um, Army Reserves in, the, in this country to help in the search to capture Hanley, Stanley Haas. So he uh, eventually is recaptured in Waterloo, Iowa, the woman and the, uh, the baby girl have been killed. His next victim, uh, Chief Hoffman, is Walter Peterson. Right. And this is, a, this is uh, I guess that phrase didn't exist at the time. This was a hate crime? Is that how you see it? It appeared to be. Um, First African-American prison guard at Western Penn. He right? was. And also uh, the, the fact that there was a, a lot of racial tensions in, in the prison at that time. Uh, Haas was part of a, a um, white group at the time. There was a, a they called themselves the Nazis at that time, and, and the president and and Haas appeared to be part of that group, uh, and it did appear to be 
a, a racial hate crime to kill Peterson. At some point along the line here, Edgar Snyder, you have your first meeting with your new client. Right. Tell us about that. At the time when uh, they brought him back, I, like everybody else in Pittsburgh, had been reading all the stories that had to do with the type of person this was. And I remember reading how he had stolen cars out in the New Kensington Lower Borough area, and he had buried these cars at night because if you would steal a car and you could dig a grave for a car and put it away for six months, it would get off the hot list, and then they would be easy to take the parts when you brought it out. And I remember saying to myself, uh, at the time, I didn't think I was strong enough to dig a three-foot hole, let alone <laughs> dig a hole for a car, that this has to be somebody that is so strong. And the, the word had already said that, you know, he was like Superman of the strength type of thing. And I remember <clears throat> them bringing him in and saying to me, look, we're going to bring him in to the Allegheny County Jail, and you'll have a chance to interview him. And we're going to put you in the room there with him, and we'll be watching right in there. Don't worry. I said, you're going to be watching right in there. Don't worry. <laughs> you're going to close the door. And I'm going to, I said, what if he doesn't want me as his lawyer? And before you can get to the door, he does me in. I said, I won't interview him unless at that time you have somebody sit in the room with me. I'm not worried about confidentiality. Let them sit over there. Just make sure they could get there. And I didn't know at the time. Uh, as it turned out, he didn't try and do any harm or anything at that point. But I remember being so petrified to sit in the same room because, you know, when you're a public defender, that doesn't mean because you're appointed to counsel that somebody wants you as their lawyer. <laughs> I mean, that was something that happened at that point. And I really never had any problem with him at that time and when I was representing him. But there was a tremendous amount of fear on my part from everything that I had read. And uh, in reading this book, I had good reason to be afraid yeah. at that particular period of time. So that uh, I had no problem as his lawyer, but at the first meeting, I remember uh, not being uh, very happy uh, to sit there and have to worry about my own safety. Yeah. And there were some events right before then that might be a measure of the celebrity of the case. But two uh, who would have emerged to be great political enemies, Bob Dugan and Dick Thornburg, basically fighting over Stanley Haas and who was going to have custody of him. And you have a almost scene from a movie where they're throwing warrants from one moving oh, car to another. Yeah, it was. What was uh, the root of that? Was it personal? I need a quick, quick summation of that. Sure. Yeah. Well, the quick summation was Stanley Haas was uh, probably the you know king of criminals in Pennsylvania, and I think the state wanted him for Joe Zanella. And the like, Thornburg, the feds wanted to prosecute first mm -hmm. for the kidnapping and murder of the woman and yeah. baby. They they each wanted to prosecute. They wanted to stick that dagger in first, and so it was a, it was a fight who who could wrest control of the Haas case. Yeah. Uh, the official story is that uh, Stanley Haas hung himself, hanged himself in a prison cell in Philadelphia. Edgar Snyder, you don't believe it. Uh, I don't believe it for uh, a minute. Uh, of course, I don't have any evidence before me, but I never met anyone less likely uh, in my life to have done himself in. Big I ego. That, uh, the biggest. Yeah. The biggest ego. <laughs> and he was proud of all of his accomplishments as a criminal. So as long as he's alive, he can continue to be uh, infamous. And why would he do himself in? And Joe Hoffman, you do believe it. I believe he committed suicide. I think it's become urban legend that, that he hasn't. I, I don't agree with it. Um, I think the mental state and seeing him, uh, he was depressed constantly. Um, you could see it uh, when you talk to him. You could see it in his eyes. Uh, and there's uh, attempts by many people in prison uh, to commit suicide. Right. He knew he was never going to see the light of day for, for the heinous crimes he committed. Got around. The book is Born to Lose by uh, James Hollick. Interesting read back with some final thoughts in just a moment. Once again, a fascinating story told in the book Born to Lose, the story of Stanley B. Haas, written by James Hollick from Butler, Butler. Pennsylvania. The book is uh, by Kent State University Press. If they don't have it at your local bookstore, they might. But if they don't, uh, they can order it. It's also available at Amazon.com. Thanks to all of our guests. We wish you a great holiday weekend. Thanks for joining us. So long.